everyone. Welcome to today's episode of Low Season Traveller Insider Guides. I'm your host, Kate Burgess. We travel over to Western Australia today to Fremantle, a small port city just near Perth, about 16 kilometres out. It boasts some of the most incredible history, culture, and art. And in this episode, you'll hear that I say it was named seventh best city in the world by Lonely Planet which is a huge commendation. I chat with Michael from Fremantle Tours, who is a wonderfully passionate Fremantle local. He tells us a little bit about Fremantle's history, the future of Fremantle and the incredible Rottnest Island. Hope you enjoy. Michael, hello. Welcome to today's episode of Low Season Travel Insider Guides. How are you? I'm so wonderful today. Thanks for having me, Kate. So I'm really excited to talk about Fremantle today, a place that I unfortunately have never been. Um, But the first question that I like to ask all my guests is when you step out of your home in Frio, what do you see, hear and smell? This is a great question, I think, as we as Frio have got so much going on in our little space. So when I walk out of my house, I can often still hear the port working. I can hear a little clunk and whir. I can hear our town hall bell tolling from where we live. So that really uh, nice community element. But my favourite is the smell. I think that's the most important because we have breweries brewing. You can smell when they're going on. There's a lot of bakeries, amazing restaurants, so lots of different smells happening as we walk through town. Um, Sometimes you can smell a sheep ship as well, Mm -hmm. which is part of Frio's port (laughs) culture. And it's a big part of the locals. I walked out of the house yesterday, actually, and... I looked at my neighbour and we both went, oh, yeah, that's that's what's happening. So it's a great, you really feel connected to the city by what you experience straight away. That's amazing. You never know what you're going to get. Is it going to be freshly baked croissants? Is it going to be sheep shit? Who knows? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so for those of our listeners that don't know about Fremantle, um, could you give us a little bit of an overview of where Fremantle is, the best way to get there and the best way to get around when you are there? Certainly, yeah. So Fremantle is the coastal city of Perth, Western Australia. So we're not far away, only about 16 k's uh, from the capital, but it is a sprawling suburban city. So we're all sort of joined up and Fremantle is really sort of that boho coastal area mixed with a very working class history. So a really up and coming area where warehouses are now getting turned into a lot more interesting things with restaurants and bars. So it's up and coming in a lot of respects but also has that real coastal chill to it. So there's two beaches in the centre of town, really a bit of a hippie vibe kicking through there as well. And just a really short 30-minute train ride from Perth CBD. So really easy to get there in that regard. And then flights are into Perth, Western Australia. So it's pretty comfortable to get here. The easiest way to get around Fremantle, though, is definitely on foot or by bicycle. It's a great way. Once you're here, set yourself up. You can hire bikes from so many spots. Um, and just explore the town at your own pace and take it all in. Awesome. Um, So I would also like to know a little bit about Fremantle's history. As you mentioned, it is a very large port city um, and it's quite an interesting convict past. Could you tell us a little bit about this and how people can experience that uh, past in Fremantle? Certainly. Fremantle has got this gorgeous mix of old and new right together in the centre of town in that you can experience some of our earliest convict history from the 1850s, Uh, bearing in mind we were only colonised in 1829. Before that was the Wajak Noongar people here for 40,000 plus years. So we can interact directly with this convict culture, with buildings that were built by them that are still occupied today as accommodation, hotels and restaurants, or you can go up to the gorgeous Fremantle Prison, or as it was originally known, the convict establishment built by these blokes so only male convicts came to WA no ladies uh, which caused a lot of problems down the track (laughs) and the space today is a space you can go in for tours you can go through the original establishment as the building is as it was from 1850 you can also take in some of the insights because it was used continuously as a place for prisoners until 1991 so it's a very modern prison also yeah. So I can uh, see the walls from my house and it's amazing to think that just almost 30 years, not even 30 years ago, there were people, maximum security inmates locked up there. 
So you can go in and go through and see the convict era of the history all the way through to the modern era. Uh, or if you're into a little bit more fun stuff, you can sleep there. There's a, a hostel inside the prison. Oh, ho, ho. I know, not for me, to be honest. Yeah, I not for me either. <laughs> it's very geeky. You can do, they did all, each summer, outdoor movie series. And we're seeing that extended to all year round because we have such great weather through here in Fremantle. Uh, concerts in the prison grounds as well. You can even get married there if you're into it. I, in okay. the original prison chapel. Yeah, if that's what people yeah. are into, it's awesome that they provide that service. Maybe visitors can, you know, it could be like a Vegas thing where they come in and it's a shotgun yeah. wedding at the Fremantle Insane. prison. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my word. But I think the most important thing about that is that the, the history is preserved because we're still using it today, mm. even though it's in a modern sense. But I'm a bit of a history nerd. I can love going into a museum or the prison in this circumstance reading everything about it, doing a tour. And that's how I get to really fall in love with a space. Whereas my dad, not so into it, but he can go there and watch a prison theme movie on a deck chair and have a beer and then goes, oh, it is important we keep this. So I think it's a great way to keep it really current. Yeah. Mm. And yeah, something for everyone. As <laughs> Definitely. Well. Yeah. yeah. Very diverse. And so in contrast to that, which you mentioned, that Fremantle also has a 40,000-year Aboriginal history. Um, is there any way that people can experience that Aboriginal culture when they're visiting as well? There is, certainly. Which is, yeah, There is. It's great. The, the beach in central Fremantle, which is known as Bathers Beach, its traditional name is Manjari, which means the meeting place or trading place, which I love because for 40,000 years, people have used this area to meet and trade with goods and trade information and meet with people and then today uh, if you were to come to Fremantle you are coming to meet up to share stories and to trade goods with all our artisans so there's this beautiful continuity of culture over 40,000 years uh, and at that beach there's a Walilup cultural centre so that's an Aboriginal cultural centre all about um, Fremantle's traditional owners they do art classes language classes uh, and we are seeing also a new civic centre being built, also named after the traditional name of Fremantle, Walyalup, and that will have a bit more of a, a stronger Indigenous focus also, which we're really excited to see. Fantastic. Able to immerse yourself into it and learn it. I, I haven't experienced any other areas that, that teach the language like that. That's really awesome that yeah, they do that. It's, it's not great. just sort of... And it's an initiative put on by the city of Fremantle to broaden that understanding and knowledge so throughout the year they do courses that are either free or nominal charge like $60 for a term and you get to go through the Noongar language and it's a great way to connect to a culture that in a city scape when you're surrounded by maybe new restaurants and bars and street art it's a bit harder to connect with but when you start getting the language it really helps you connect directly with this culture that's still here today which was so fortunate to have. And on that same note of the history and the culture that Fremantle has, I'd love for you to tell our audience about the iconic roundhouse, the oldest building in Western Australia. It's crazy. Right in the middle of Frio, uh, overlooking the ocean, is the roundhouse, which, bearing in mind, it's built in early 1830s, finished in 1831. We were colonised just two years earlier in 1829, but we were reported as a gentleman's estate. No riffraff. Mm -hmm no troublemakers, and yet the first major building we built was a prison. <laughs> so <laughs> they got up to a bit of mischief. We had a pretty hard start to our colony and they needed somewhere to keep people in check. And it's uh, quite a gorgeous space where you look out over Bathers Beach that we just mentioned and you can still go into it today for a gold coin donation. They fire a cannon here every day at one o'clock. Cool. Which is an amazing uh, way to, again, connect to history, maybe in a different way. So traditionally, they would fire a cannon here or set a fire at 1 p.m. for ship captains to set their ship clock. And that way you knew what time it was exactly so then you could accurately navigate. So that time ball, you see at Times Square that drops, mm -hmm. that's based on this system. So we have a ball that drops and the expression to be on the ball mm. uh, comes from this piece of equipment that isn't unique to free. It was used all over the world at ports as a way for captains when the ball drops and the cannons fired, they can then work out the exact moment that one o'clock hits and thus not get lost, hopefully, for the rest of their journey. So it's this really modern navigational component and this 
old, gorgeous limestone building. And you can go into the cells, which I find just like at the convict establishment, it's quite intriguing, but also quite confronting because it's quite mm. modern. Any of our European history here is so modern. Um, so it really hits home that people were in here and often uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, in the roundhouse. And it was used as a holding cell for Aboriginal Australians before they were set over to wadge them up over to Rotnest. So it has big connections to our history here as well. So I saw that Frio was named the seventh best city in the world by Lonely Planet, which is a huge commendation and incredibly impressive. And Lonely Planet called it a friend you haven't seen in years. And what my take from that was that it just gives Fremantle this warm and welcoming feeling. But how important are the locals into contributing to that title and what kind of relationship and what is that culture like between the locals and the tourists that come? I think it is just like an old friend. It's someone you haven't met, but you're going to become quick friends with. And the relationship with locals to visitors is so vital, but the lines are completely blurred. It's one of those amazing holiday destinations where people visit and they get stuck. They fall in love and they never leave. So the people that were visitors last year are now locals. And you have this gorgeous mix of multicultural, different ages, different people just loving this space and staying here. So in that regard, there's a lot of people reaching out and helping people when they arrive as visitors. So if you if you pull your map out on the street, someone will come up to you and give you a hand very quickly, um, which I think is it's perfect. We're a little place. There's only 30,000 people that live in Fremantle. So wow, we're like a small country that. town. Yeah. So it means you get a lot of g'day, how you're goings as mm. you walk down the street, a lot of people you recognise that you don't necessarily know, but you treat like a neighbour. So we actually start all of our tours warning people that we're going to be stopped sometime on the tour. And half the time it's by a mate, someone we know, and the other half it's just by completely a random person who lives in Frio who wants to put their two bob in to give, the, to give us their opinion, which I think is amazing. Yeah, I mean, that's how people want to experience it. That's how they want it. They want the random local to come in and explain a story about whatever you're looking at. And Yeah, my auntie used to work here. Did you know that? It's just amazing. Yeah, I think it's great. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, I bet bet, bet your, like, customers absolutely love that. (laughs) It's so crazy. And they don't believe me. They think I'm sort of geeing them up. And it's quite amazing to have people yell at you from cars and in a positive way (laughs) like hey michael don't listen to him or you know it's really fun or shop owners come out to say g'day how you going because that local aspect comes all the way through to the business because 80 percent of the businesses in Fremantle are locally owned and operated so they you have that owner operator the person making your coffee or pouring a beer probably owns the place so if you want to get into that culture while you're visiting if you're just chatting to the people around you you'll quickly get some little insights on where to go or what to enjoy. So it's imperative. The locals love the visitors. Uh, we're, we're missing them at the moment. We can't wait to have a few extra humans back. Yeah, understandable. And that also just makes you feel so good about supporting all of the local bars and the restaurants, knowing that, what did you say, 80% are locally owned? 80%. That's a huge it's amount. Amazing. That's incredible for a city. Yeah. It's um, even when you walk down the main street, the Cappuccino Strip, they're all independent businesses and the few franchises are locally owned franchises. So the people that own it, mm. even though it's a, a big ice cream chain, they still live in Fremantle. So they embody that local business, even though they're representing a bigger brand perhaps. So we always say that local doesn't mean they have to be right here in the middle of Frio every day. It just means mm. how they behave as well. If they're willing to work alongside and welcome people in, then that's a win. And that's Frio's culture to a T. Yeah. Oh, it sounds beautiful. But also, I want to hear more about this Cappuccino Street. That is, firstly, yeah. a very fun name. I like yeah, that a lot. The <laughs> Cappuccino Strip joins some of the biggest attractions in Frio. So if you get off the train coming from Perth, for example, at the train station, that's one end of the Cappuccino Strip. And if you walk up it, you finish at the really infamous Fremantle Markets, which is then just around the corner from the Fremantle Prison as well. So in between those major events is all these restaurants, cafes, all outdoor dining. There's a street down the middle that has a very low speed limit and is closed to the public occasionally, which is great to the cars. And you'll see seven of our nine Italian restaurants all on that street. 
So we have a huge Love Italian it. culture in Rio, hence the cappuccino or that espresso culture that's come from our Italian immigration. Now, I know this isn't technically Fremantle, but I do have to ask you about Rottnest Island. It has recently just shot up to fame because of those incredibly cute quokkas that live there. And mm. if the audience have not seen a photo of a quokka, pause this podcast now and go Google quokkas because you will not regret it. Um, and if you don't know what they are, if you might have seen the famous photo with Chris Hemsworth posing with one of the quokkas, that's definitely something that contributed to that. So if people are coming to stay in Fremantle, what's the best way to visit Rottnest Island? Are there day tours out there? Do people stay out there? What's the go? You've got a lot of options. And basing yourself, as you just said, Kate, in Fremantle is the best way to get the most time or ease your journey over to Rottnest. And it's just a, about a 40 minute ferry ride from Fremantle. So it's not far off the, the coast and you go to this delightful island. You can go for a day trip and especially during the lower season, you can get these great day trips where you go in off peak times from 10 in the morning, say till 6 PM or, and you can still get the whole day. And when you get over to the island, there's no cars. You can hire yourself a bicycle and some snorkeling gear and get all the way around the island. It's only about 20 kilometers around. So it's quite achievable. Or you can get a bus that drops you to all the gorgeous beaches. And on the island, there's a couple of pubs, some hotels, some glamping accommodation, some very ritzy accommodation as well. So you can stay uh, a few nights is a great way to really just immerse yourself in that holiday beach vibes. It's a pretty phenomenal. And I, I know I mentioned snorkeling equipment and our lower season which is winter but it's on the Lewin current which brings hot water down from the tropics which means we get all these coral species and fish species that shouldn't be here so the, mm. the snorkeling is phenomenal if you're into that and can you do that just off Fremantle as well or is it better to go to Rottnest Island for that you won't get the corals and the fun stuff like that here in Frio it's still a lot of fish mm -hmm. life but uh yeah definitely out at Rottnest for that amazing dive or snorkel experience awesome Another great low season activity, which I personally think it's great, is going to the footy. Fremantle have the Fremantle Dockers, a very great football team. Um, and although the stadium is in Perth, do you recommend visitors going to go see a Dockers game? I think you've got to. I, we personally <laughs> love when we travel is go to a local sporting game to really get that element of the culture. We enjoy a bit of sport, so it's a great way to see what's happening. And... Well, the Frio Dockers, here in Fremantle, we bleed purple. We love the Dockers. Their purple is their colours. And the new stadium that's been built at Optus Stadium is an attraction in its own right to visit. It's mm. a beautiful space to see. Uh, and the perfect winter activity because we have mostly good weather here through the winter, so you're not going to have to be wet or cold. I would also recommend getting to a footy match in Fremantle is a great way to see something as well, is from our local league. It's a very passionate uh, West Australian Football League or the AFLW. The women's yeah. games are all held right in Fremantle and are just $10 to go see. Awesome. So it's a much more community-driven element to the sport and you can be right down the boundary and get some high fives and actually interact with the players, which is really enjoyable. That's really cool. And as you said, with the very friendly Fremantle people, if you don't understand the rules or what's going on, turn to the guy or girl next to you and they will happily explain it to you. Because you know if they're at a community match that they're going to absolutely love the footy and be very keen to share all the wonderful things that footy has to offer. Indeed, we love it. So when is Fremantle's low season and are there any advantages of visiting the low season? I think the the biggest advantage is that we're very lucky here in Fremantle. We have 300 days of sunshine a year. So there's <laughs> two months, let's like, let's say two months of rain and Perth rain or West is actually pretty minor. It's nothing mm. compared to uh, when we've lived in the Southwest in Margaret river or my beautiful wife is from Edinburgh. I like to say a Fremantle summer's day is like a Scottish winter's day, but it rains uh, Scottish summer's day, but it rains more in Scotland. So you yeah, can't wow. go wrong. And so if you're visiting in that lower season any time from sort of April through to August or so, you've still mm -hmm. got all the events, all the main attractions are open. The Fremantle markets, for example, are open just every weekend of the year. That's it. So you can, you're not going to miss out. You can come see the footy, which is only on in the winter. 
and there's just less humans. So you can get to really get into that experience and get that, that true local vibe uh, without quite as many people getting around. I will say uh, the majority of our audience is based in the UK and I think you have just put so much jealousy <laughs> within them saying you have 300 days of summer and sunshine and I, even me in Melbourne, I feel very envious of that. It sounds, it sounds pretty wonderful. Yeah, we, um, we love to shout that from the rooftops, but we know it definitely can make people a bit jealous. But that is why no matter how many times we travel or leave, we always come back to Fremantle because it's, it's like being on holiday every day. Oh, that is a beautiful sentiment to end on. I very much looking forward to you, talking to you again, Michael, for our next episode to learn more about the culture, arts and food that Fremantle has to offer. Gorgeous. Thank you so much, Kate. Well, with 300 days a year of sunshine and no crowds, it would be silly not to go to Fremantle in the low season. Thank you again to Michael for joining us. He'll be again with us on Thursday for an incredible episode on the culture, art and food that Fremantle has to offer. Thank you for joining us. If you have any destinations that you would like to hear more about, contact us on our social channels at Low Season Traveller. Don't forget to share this with your friends, family and social networks. Mm -hmm.